Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Wardog Sec back with another video for you guys, and we are in TriHack Me once again, and we are on the Junior Penetration Tester Learning Path Network Security Area, and this is the Active Reconnaissance Room. Learn how to use simple tools such as Traceroute, Ping, Telnet, and a web browser to gather information. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Task one, introduction. In the first room of the network security module, we focused on passive reconnaissance. In the second room, we focus on active reconnaissance and the essential tools related to it. We learn to use a web browser to collect more information about our target. Moreover, we discuss using simple tools such as ping, traceroute, telnet, and NC, which is netcat, to gather information about the network system and services. As we learned in the previous room, passive reconnaissance lets you gather information about your target without any kind of direct engagement or connection. You're watching from afar or checking publicly available information. Active reconnaissance requires you to make some kind of contact with your target. This contact can be a phone call or a visit to the office, oh, sorry, a visit to the target company under some pretense to gather more information, usually as part of social engineering, alternatively, it can be a direct connection to the target system, whether visiting their website or checking if their firewall has an SSH port open. Think of it like you are closely inspecting windows and door locks. Hence, it is essential to remember not to engage in active reconnaissance work before getting sig or signed legal authorization from the client. In this room, we'll focus on active reconnaissance. Active reconnaissance begins with direct connections made to the target machine, any such connection might leave information in the logs showing the client IP address, time of the connection, and duration of the connection, among other things. However, not all connections are suspicious. It is possible to let your active reconnaissance appear as regular client activity. Consider web browsing. No one would ex suspect a browser connected to a target web server among hundreds of other legitimate users. You can use such techniques to your advantage when working as part of the red team attackers and don't want to alarm the blue team defenders. In this room, we go through various tools commonly bundled with most operating systems or easily attainable. We begin with the browser and its built-in developer tools. Furthermore, we show you how a web browser can be armed to become an efficient reconnaissance framework. Afterwards, we discuss other benign tools such as ping, traceroute, and telnet. All these programs require connection to the target, and hence our activities would fall under active constant. So I'm assuming if we're going to be using Telnet and like Netcat, probably going to be doing like some banner grabbing stuff to determine what's running on that particular port. This room is of interest to anyone who wants to become uh, familiar with essential tools and how, or and see how they can use them in active constants. The web browser developer tools might take some effort to gain familiarity. Although it offers a graphical user interface, the command line tools covered are relatively straightforward to use. Important, please note that if you're not subscribed, attack box won't have internet access, so you will need to use the VPN to complete the questions that require internet access. Question time. Ensure that you understand the tools to fall under active reconnaissance. Launch the attack box if I already have it open here. You will need to answer the question, especially in later tasks. All right, so task number two, we're gonna talk about web browser stuff. The web browser can be a convenient tool, especially that it is readily available on all systems. There are several ways where you can use a web browser to gather information about a target. So I'm just going to launch Firefox while we're reading through here. On the transport layer, the browser connects to TCP port 80 by default when the website is accessed over HTTP. TCP port 443 by default when the website is accessed over HTTPS. Since 80 and 443 are default ports for HTTP and HTTPS, the web browser does not show them in the address bar. However, it is possible to use custom ports to access a service. For instance, HTTPS 127.0.0.1.8834 will connect to 127.0.0.1 localhost as part of 8834 via HTTPS protocol. If there is an HTTPS server listening on that port, we will receive a web page. While browsing a web page, you can press the Control Shift I on a PC or the Option plus Command plus I and 
I guess that's what it looks like here. On a Mac, to open the developer tools on Firefox, similar shortcuts will also get you started with Google Chrome or Chromium. Developer tools will let you inspect many things that your browser has received and exchanged with the remote server. For instance, you can view and even modify the JavaScript files, inspect the cookies on your system, uh, sorry, inspect the set Inspect the cookies set on your system and discover the folder structure on the site client or content. Uh, below is a screenshot of Firefox developer tools. Chrome dev tools is quite similar. So if you go and you can do the shortcut, you can just go in here and go to, I believe it's more tools. And yeah, web developer tools to open it up the manual way. All right, so let's continue on. They're just showing you a screenshot of what it looks like here. That's what it looks like. So let's go back out of this and let's continue on here. And if I just raise it up here a little bit, you can see what uh, developer tools brings inside of here. So we got network stuff, debugger, all kinds of stuff. So if you go to network, you can hit refresh and I'll bring up some stuff in there that some more information. But all right, let's continue on. There are also plenty of add-ons for Firefox Chrome that help in penetrate testing. Here are a few examples. Now be sure to read through these all the way. You got Foxy Proxy, which we have already installed here. It lets you quickly change the proxy server you are using to access the target website. So if you want to switch around to like Burp or something else to send your traffic through, you can do that easily through here. You can disable it. User Agent Switcher and Manager gives you the ability to pretend to be accessing the web page from a different operating system or a different browser. Web Appalizer or Wappalizer, provides insights about the technologies used on the visited websites. Such extension is handy primarily when you collect all this information, etc., etc. This is what it looks like here, and you can install it. It's not installed here, but this is what it looks like. Whenever you browse to uh, specific websites, it'll tell you some information about it, like this. Let's continue on. Over time, you might find a few extensions that fit perfectly in your workflow. All right, question time. Browse the following website and ensure that you have opened your developer tools on attack box, Firefox, or the browser on your computer using the developer tools uh, figure out the total number of questions. All right, so be sure to check this out and let's come back for the actual uh, solution to this, the correct answer. If you're not able to find the answer, well, guess what? We're about to find out right now. So you navigate to this particular website they want you to go to have web developer tools open and this is the network tab we're taking a look at here now you have to go in and take a look at this uh, script.js right so if you just you can just copy and paste it or you can leave open this in a new tab yep like so and you go through you can see the questions here so there is a total of eight questions according to that so let's go ahead and type in eight there we go now task number three here we're going to talk about ping. Ping should remind you of the game. Ping pong, table tennis, you throw the ball and expect to get it back. The primary purpose of ping is to check whether you can reach the remote system and that the remote system can reach you back. In other words, initially, this was used to check network connectivity. However, we are more interested in its use, different uses, checking whether the remote system is online. In simple terms, the ping command sends a packet to a remote system and the remote system replies this way you can conclude that the remote system is online and that the network is working between the two systems if you prefer a pickier definition the ping is a command that sends an icmp echo packet to a remote system if the remote system is online and the ping packet was correctly routed and not blocked by any firewall the remote system would send back a icmp echo reply Similarly, the ping reply should reach the first system if appropriately routed and not blocked by any firewall. The object of such a command is to ensure that the target system is online before we spend time carrying out more detailed scans to discover the running operating system and services. On our attack box terminal, you can start the ping command as the following here. So I'm going to copy and paste this and we're going to take a look at the terminal here. Paste this in here. It's what ping looks like. I'm sure everyone has used ping at some point in their career or even in uh, school. But let's go ahead and continue. You can see it doesn't stop here as opposed to Windows. It will ping it like maybe four or five times or something and stop. But in Linux, it just keeps going until you stop it. Or you can, I believe you can set the amount of um, 
ping request you want to send out. But anyway, let's continue. Uh, you can ping the host name as well. And the later, the system uh, needs to resolve host name to an IP address before sending the ping packet. If you don't specify the content on the Linux system, um, or sorry, you don't specify the count on the Linux system, you will need to hit the control C as I've already stated to force it to stop. Hence, you might consider the following here. So if you do ping dash C, if you just want to send 10 packets, this is the equivalent to the following here on a MS Windows system. So let me clear all this stuff out of here like so, and then paste this in and I should ping it 10 times. Technically speaking, ping falls under the protocol ICMP, which stands for the Internet Control Message Protocol. ICMP supports many types of queries, but in particular, we are interested in ping ICMP echoed forward slash type eight and ping reply, which is a uh, reply type zero. Getting into ICMP details is not required to use ping. In the following example, we have specified the number or total number uh, of packets to five. From the attack boxes terminal, we started pinging the following IP address. We learned that 10.10.239.217 is up and is not blocking ICMP echo requests. Moreover, any firewalls and routers on the packet route are not blocking ICMP echo requests either. And we've already ran this here, so let's continue on here. And the example above, we saw clearly that the target system is responding. The ping output is an indicator that it is online and reachable. We have transmitted five packets and we received five replies. We noticed that on average, it took around 0.475 milliseconds for the reply to reach our system with any maximum being 0.636 milliseconds. From a penetration testing point of view, we will try to discover more about this target. We will try to learn as much as possible, for example, which ports are open and which services are running. Let's consider the following case. We shut down the target virtual machine and then tried to ping it. As you expect, in the following example, we don't receive any reply. And that's what it looks like here, host unreachable. In this case, we already know that we have shut down the target computer that has the 10.10.239.217. For each ping, the system we are using, attack box in this case, is responding with destination host unreachable. We can see that we have transmitted five packets, but none was received, resulting in a 100% packet loss. So be sure to try this out if you uh, want to see this on your own. I'm not going to do it. Uh, generally speaking, when you, we don't get a ping reply back, there are a few explanations that would explain why we didn't get a ping reply. For example, they have listed out here. The destination computer is not responsive, possibly still booting up or turned off, or the OS has crashed. It's unplugged from the network, or there's a faulty network device across the path. A firewall is configured to block such packets. Um, your system is unplugged from the network. Okay, now let's continue to the questions. Which option could you use to set the size of the data carried by the ICMP echo request? Um, let's go ahead and see if we can find this out. So we do ping, I think dash H or something. Okay. And it wants us to send the size of the data. So if we look in here and try to figure that out, it should be maybe the packet size. So let's do dash S. Here we go. What is the size of the ICMP header and bytes? And I don't know if that was explained or not, but let's go ahead and try to find this. Hey everybody, just a quick little blurb here. As you can see here, most people that view my channel are not subscribers. If you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you're enjoying the video, please consider hitting the like button. It helps get me in the algorithm, helps spread the good word out there helps bring more people and increase our glorious community here. All right, I'm all about helping out others. I know what it's like to come up in cybersecurity or even try to get into cybersecurity and not knowing where to look. I'm just having this channel up so I can help out other people. All right, that's all I got. This one should be eight. As we can see here under packet size, it says that, which translate into 64 ICP, uh, data bytes when combined with eight bytes of ICMP header data. So go ahead and type in eight. There we go. Does MS Windows, which is Microsoft Windows, firewall block ping by default? And that's a yes. 
because if you scroll back up here, it says right here, note that Microsoft Windows Firewall blocks ping by default. And deploy the VM for this task, which is already done, and then ping this following IP address. So let's go ahead and just do it again. Let's quit out of this, clear all this out, and paste this in there. It says, how many ping replies did you get back? And it should be 10. You sent over 10 um, echoes, right? Yeah. 10, uh, 10 packets transmitted and uh, 10 received. So let's go ahead and continue to task number four here. We're going to be getting into uh, traceroute, apparently. As the name suggests, the traceroute command traces the route taken by the packets from your system to another host. The purpose of a traceroute is to find the IP addresses of the routers or hops that a packet traverses as it goes from your system to a target host. This command also reveals the number of routers between the two systems. It is helpful as it indicates the number of hops, routers between your system and the target host. However, note that the route taken by the packets might change as many routers use dynamic routing protocols that adapt to network changes on Linux and Mac OS. The command to use trace route is the following here, trace route, then IP address. And on Microsoft Windows, it's tracert. Uh, the following IP address, trace route tries to discover the routers across the path from your system to the target system. So if you want to go ahead and ch try it out, I'm just going to copy and paste it over to the terminal, clear all this stuff out. And let's go ahead and paste this in. There we go. There's no direct way to discover the path from your system to a target system. We rely on ICMP to trick the routers into revealing their IP addresses. We can accomplish this by using a small time to live TTL in the IP header field, although the T in TTL stands for time. TTL indicates the maximum number of routers slash hops that a packet can pass through before being dropped. TTL is not a maximum number of time units. When a router receives a packet, it decrements the TCL or TTL uh, by one before passing it to another. No, the following um, figure shows that each time the IP packet passes through a router, the um, TTL value is decremented by one. Initially, it leaves the system with a TTL value of 64. It reaches the target system with a TTL value of 60 after passing through four routers. And this is what it looks like here. That's not displaying very well, but this is how it looks like here. They're doing the trace route, pass through these routers here to get to the actual target system. And let's continue on. It's showing you how it decrements by one every time it goes through um, each hop. However, if the TTL reaches zero, it will be dropped and an ICMP time to live exceeded would be sent to the original sender in the following figure. The system set TTL to one before sending it to the router. The first router on the path decrements the uh, TTL by one, resulting in a TTL of zero. Consequently, this router will discard the packet and send an ICMP time exceeded in transit error message. Note that some routers are configured not to send such ICMP messages when discarding a packet. And it's another infographic of the process here. Let's continue on. On Linux, trace route. We'll start by sending UDP datagrams within IC or within IP packets of TTL being one. Thus, it causes the first router to encounter a TTL equal zero and send an ICMP time to live exceeded back. Hence, a TTL of one will reveal the IP address of the first router to you. Then it will send another packet with TTL equals two. This packet will be dropped at the second router and so on. Let's try this on live systems. In the following examples, we run the same command. So let's go ahead and run this inside of our terminal here. There we go. So traceroute, tryhackme.com from the tryhackme attack box. We notice that different uh, runs might lead to different routes taken by the packets. Traceroute A, and this is basically, uh, I believe this, they're just doing like a comparison or something, right? So you might have different results than I have, or even the screenshot from what they're saying. And let's go ahead and continue here. So they had 14 
total it looks like. And mine had nine. In the trace route outputs above, we have 14 number lines. Each line represents one router or hop. Our system sends three packets with TTL set to one, then three packets with TTL set to two, and so forth. Depending on the network topology, we might get replies from up to three routers. Depending on the route taken by the target, consider line number 12 with or the 12th router with the listed IP address has dropped the packet three times and sent an ICMP time exceeded in transit message. The line 12, and this is what it looks like here, shows the time in milliseconds for each reply to our system. On the other hand, we can see that we received only a single reply on the third line. The two stars in the output looks like the following here, line three, indicate that our system did uh, not receive two expected IC MP time exceeded in transit messages. Finally, in the first line of the output, we can see that the packets leaving the attack box take different routes. We can see two routers that responded to TTL being one. Our system never received the third expect IC MP message. Trace route B. And let's see what they say here. In a second run of the trace routes program, we noticed that the packets took a longer route this time, passing through 26 routers. If you are running a trace route to a system within your network, the route will be unlikely to change. However, we cannot expect the route to remain fixed when the packets need to go via um, other routers outside your network. To summarize, we can uh, notice the following. The number of hops routers between your system and the target system depends on the time you are running trace route. There's no guarantee that your packets will always follow the same route. Even if you're on the same network or you repeat the route or trace route command within a short time, some routers return a public IP address. You might examine a few of these routers based on the scope of the intended penetration testing. Uh, some routers don't reply. All right, question time. And trace route A, what is the IP address of the last router hop before reaching try hack me. So let's go ahead and take a look here. And we're gonna take a look at uh, trace route A. So it looks like it's going to be this IP address here. Let's go ahead and grab this and paste it. And trace route B, what is the IP address of the last router hop before reaching try hack me? So same thing here, look at this last one. And it should be this 104 IP address here. So let's go ahead and copy this and paste it in. I'm sorry, before, yeah. So let's go ahead and get this in there. And trace route B, how many routers are between the two systems? And it's going to be 26 are between them. Start the attached VM, which I already have started. Um, run trace route to the following IP address, which you've already done. But let's go ahead and clear all this stuff out of here. And we're up arrow. All right. And there we go. Check how many routes or routers hops are between the attack box and a target system. And you can take a look here. It's just one. So complete. And task number five, we are going to talk about uh, Telnet. The Telnet, what stands for Teletype Network Protocol, was developed in 1969 to communicate with a remote system via a command line interface, which is CLI. Hence, the command Telnet uses the Telnet protocol for remote administration. So here uses port 23. From a security perspective, Telnet sends all the data, including usernames and passwords, in clear text. Sending in clear text makes it easy for anyone who has access to the communication channel to steal the login credentials. The secure alternative is SSH, which is a secure shell protocol. However, the Telnet client, with its simplicity, can be used for other purposes, knowing the uh, Telnet client uh, relies on the TCP protocol. You can use Telnet to connect to any service and grab its banner, as I stated at the beginning of this video, I believe. Using the Telnet IP address and then port. You can connect to any service running on TCP and even exchange a few messages unless it uses encryption. 
Let's say we want to discover more information about a web server. Listening on port 80, we connect to the server at port 80, and then we communicate using the HTTP uh, protocol. You don't need to dive into the HTTP protocol. You just need to issue the get um, forward slash HTTP forward slash 1.1 to specify something other than the default index page. You can issue get then forward slash page dot HTTP ML HTTP forward slash 1.1, which will request page dot HTML. We also specified to the remote web server that we want to use HTTP version 1.1 for communication. To get a valid response instead of an error, you need to input some value for the host, host, um, colon example, and hit enter twice. Executing these steps will provide the requested index page. All right, so let's take a look at this Telnet real quick. I don't think Telnet is installed on Windows machines by default anymore, so you have, I think you have to install that manually. But it's on Linux, I believe, by default. Let's go ahead and check it here. Okay, so we have that first initial... Um, command in here, telnet to the target IP, and then uh, the port we're going to take a look at here. Now it says here we need to put this get um, information inside of here. So let's go ahead and do that. Copy and paste. This is our best friend. And it should look something like this as soon as it replies. Ah, I forgot to do this. So let's add that in there. There we go. Ah, now we're going. Okay, so this is what it looks like here, and it's running Apache 2.4.10 Debian. And let's go ahead and continue on. Of particular interest for us is discovering the type and version of install web server. In this example, we communicated with a web server, so we used basic HTTP commands. If we connect it to a mail server, we need to use proper commands based on the protocol, such as SMTP and POP. Three. Question time. Start the attached VM, which we already have started. Open the terminal and use the Telnet client to connect to uh, the VM on port 80. What's running on the server? Well, well, we can see here that it's running Apache. So this is probably what they're just looking for, Apache, as the answer. If I can copy this out of here, like so. And let's continue on to the next question. What is the version that's running on it? And we can see that's running 2.4.2. 10. So let's go ahead and type this in. There we go. Now let's continue on to task number six. We're going to talk about netcat. Netcat, or simply NC, has different applications that can be of great value to a penetration tester. Netcat supports both TCP and UDP protocols. It can function as a client that connects to a listening port. Alternatively, it can act as a server that listens on a port of your choice. Hence, it is a convenient tool that you can use as a simple client or server over TCP or UDP. If you've done any type of CTF type work, you probably used Netcat before. First, you can connect to a server as you did with the Telnet to collect its banner using the following information. Uh, netcat or nc and then ip address of the target and then the port which is quite similar to the previous uh, telnet ip and the port note that you might need to press shift plus enter after the get line so let's go ahead and try this with netcat so copy this out of here and paste it let me clear all this stuff out and then paste this in here like so and it should be connecting now as that's running let's go ahead and get this ready to go So let's go ahead and paste this in, and then it says shift and enter to get a new line. But okay, it already went. Awesome. Bad request. All right, now you can see I have the following information in here host is netcat, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now be sure to uh, turn off the previous virtual machine here and power on this one. Okay. Otherwise, you might have some issues. Let's continue on. And it says in the terminal shown above, we use netcat to connect to the following IP address, port 80, using the following command here. Next, we issued a get for the default page using the following. And then we specified the target server of our client supports HTTP version 1.1. Finally, we need to give a name to our host. So we added the new line host colon uh, netcat. You can name your host anything as long as it has no impact on this uh, exercise. 
based on the output server is nginx version 1.6.2 received we can tell that on port 80 we have nginx version 1.6.2 listening for incoming connections you can use netcat to listen on a tcp port and connect to a listening port on another system on the server system where you want to open a port and listen on it you can use the following which is netcat dash lp which is i think dash l is listening or listen and then p is the port for uh, the port number one two three four or better yet netcat dash vnl P1234, which is equivalent to the following here. As you would remember from the Linux room, the exact order of the letters does not matter as long as the port number is preceded directly by P. And it's, this table here explains everything. Dash L, listen to mode, dash P, port number, dash N, numeric only, et cetera, et cetera, dash V, verbose mode, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, notes, the option dash P should appear just before the port number as they said above. Uh, the option dash N will avoid DNS lookups and warnings. Port numbers less than 1024 require root privileges to listen on. On the client side, you would use the following netcat target and port number. Here is an example of using netcat to echo. After you successfully establish a connection to the server, whatever you type on the client side will be echoed on the server side and vice versa. Considering the following example, on the server side, we will listen and on port 1234. We can achieve this using the following command. So let me go ahead and clear this out of here. Oops. Okay. Well, end it for me. All right. So we're going to use netcat, and then I like to just use lnvp. That's what I'm used to putting in. So we're going to do on port 1234, like so. Now it's listening. All right, so in the case listening server, blah, blah, blah. In our case, the listening server has packages of the following. So we connect to it from the client side using netcat um, one, two, three, four. So let's continue on here. It says, in our case, the listening server has the IP address of the following here. So we can connect to it from the client side by executing the following netcat IP address and the port is one, two, three, four. This setup would echo whatever you type on the other side, the other side of the TCP tunnel. You can find a recording of the process below. Note that the listening server is on the left side of the screen. So check that out or test out yourself if you want to uh, try that. But let's continue on to the questions here, which I have already done. And it says, uh, which version are we running? So we did netcat, target IP, and then the uh, port is going to be 21. And the version is going to be uh, 0 0.17. So 0 0.17 for the FTP, right? So let's go ahead and submit that. There we go. And let's go ahead and continue on to close out this video. Task number seven, putting it all together. In this room, we have covered many various tools. It is easy to put a few of them together via a shell script to build a primitive network and system scanner. You can use the trace route to map the path to the target ping to check if the system responds to IC, MP, Echo, and Telnet to check which ports are open and reachable by attempting to connect to them. Available scanners do this at much more advanced and sophisticated levels, as we will see in the next four rooms with Nmap. And there's a table of everything here, uh, ping, ping stuff here, examples, trace route, tracer, Telnet, etc., etc. Although these are fundamental tools, they are readily available on most systems. In particular, a web browser is installed on practically every computer and smartphone and can be an essential tool in your arsenal for conducting reconnaissance without raising alarms. If you want to gain more profound knowledge of the developer tools, we recommend joining the walking and application room. And there's a table of shortcuts here for developer tools, Linux or Microsoft, Mac OS. Answer the questions. Ensure you gain mastery over the different basic yet essential tools we presented in this room before moving on to the more sophisticated tools. Mark that as complete and we are done. That's absolutely true. Be sure to learn the basics first, familiarize yourself with their build that good foundation and then everything else will come into play later on as you build up your skill set, etc, etc. And that wraps up this video. Hopefully you all found this of value. 
If you're new here, please consider hitting that subscribe button with the notification bell. Hit the like button if you're enjoying the content. Comment below your thoughts and opinions on the information discussed in the video. Hit the comment section. Um, as always, thank you guys for watching. Have a nice day, and I will see you later.